Dr. Trabulsi serves as the section head for the Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology and uh, director of the uh, Center for Genetic Eye Diseases in the Coli Institute. Um, he's been instrumental with the Marfan Foundation by providing medical oversight to our eye-related materials. Um, enjoys working with all types of patients, and his work has been uh, instrumental in a, a lot of describing the genetic manifestations of eye diseases. He's a frequent guest speaker at the national and international meetings, and um, he's the author of more than 400 scientific articles. Um, and his book on genetic diseases of the eye, published by the Oxford University Press, is a major reference um, in this area. Dr. Trabulsi, thank, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's very good to be with you uh, today, and uh, I recognized uh, some faces in the audience, some people in the audience, and I'm, I'm sure there are some of you that I have probably seen and I didn't recognize. My, my memory is not as good as it, it used to be, so uh, I apologize for that. But. Uh, it, it's turning out apparently to be a very good day with a lot of people participating. And uh, I know you, you are uh, familiar to a certain extent with the eye manifestations and problems uh, of patients who have Marfan syndrome. Uh, but I thought I would present uh, a few things that may add to your knowledge. And I will try to keep them um, at, at a level that is not too complex, but at the same time, I think uh, you want to know a little bit more. So I, 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 there, there, would, there will be a few things there that are maybe a little bit more uh, complex than, than f uh, the, the average uh, non-medical person would know, but uh, I hope you can take some of that uh, with you. So uh, just quickly, uh, to remind everyone of uh, the structures in the eye, the anatomy of the eye. Um, I don't know if we have a, a pointer, but going from uh, the front to the back, the cornea is the transparent hourglass structure. Uh, behind it is the anterior chamber of the lens that's filled with fluid, with aqueous humor. Uh, then you have the iris and the pupil, and right behind them is the structure that causes a lot of the problems uh, in patients with Marfan syndrome, which is the lens. This is what you're going to hear me talk about the most. Uh, and behind that is the vitreous cavity, that gel that fills the eye, which is generally normal in patients who have Marfan syndrome, as opposed to uh, Stickler syndrome, which is another connective tissue disorder where the gel is more watery. Uh, and this is why when we do surgery on patients who have Marfan syndrome to remove their lenses, the lens does not, although it's dislocated, does not sink to the back of the eye because the, behind it is a cushion uh, of gel. Uh, so that makes uh, the surgery easier. And all the way in the back, you see the optic nerve um, and lining the inside of the eye is the retina. And you, you've all heard about retinal detachments as being a complication uh, uh, of surgery in Marfan syndrome. And also that it, w it can, where's the point? Oh, this one, okay. It can uh, happen spontaneously. So we'll address all of these as we go forward. You probably heard 50 times already today that, uh, and you know that your condition is caused by mutations in the gene that goes, codes for fibrillin. And fibrillin is a very uh, abundant component of uh, all tissues, but especially in, in the eye. And we, we did those studies in, back in, in the early 90s, and we showed that fibrillin <coughs> is in the iris, is in the optic nerve, is in the cornea, is in the retina. It's everywhere in the eye. Um, what I'm going to concentrate on in the next couple of minutes is the zonule. We, you hear about people calling the zonules, but in fact, there's, it's a single, single, or singular, singular uh, uh, term that refers to the whole set of these small filaments that suspend the lens in its place. And uh, I like this definition of the zonule uh, that uh, Dirk Hubmacher, who's here in the audience, and uh, Sunil Abdi, who's one of my close collaborators at the clinic, came up with. It's a cell-free, macroscopic, so you can see it without, you don't need a microscope to see it, microfibril-based rigging 
that spans two basement membranes. Tissues in general have a ba or cell layers have a basement membrane underneath them, and these two basement membranes are the lens capsule and the internal limiting membrane of the ciliary body. So it goes between those two that rigging holds the lens in place. Um, predominantly composed of fibrillin, and you see in the bottom is in the lens, and those. Uh, wavy lines that you can see coming out of it are elongated uh, zonular fibers and they're stained pink here or, or red uh, by an antibody against fibrillin. Um, in the lens itself, fibrillin is, is located in the capsule. So the lens is like a bag and it's filled with uh, protein, uh, but it, it, that bag uh, has areas where those fibrillin microfibrils attach and then they go to the other side to the ciliary uh, process. So they go from here all the way to the ciliary processes. And uh, this is what we call a scanning electron micrograph. So at very high levels you can see the zonules come down at, and then attach to the bag of the lens. Uh, here's another um, way of showing the zonules, the lens, and the ciliary processes. And we know that fibrillin there uh, does not work alone in making these biomechanical attachments. There are a number of other molecules that are involved, a number of other uh, proteins that are involved. And this is why there are other conditions like weill marcassani syndrome and, and others where a problem in a protein other than fibrillin would also cause the lens to be dislocated. And there's a number of them. We're not going to go over those today, just to let you know that dislocation of the lens is not unique to the Marfan syndrome. There are other conditions where that happens. So if this is the normal microfibrils in a uh, lens capsule. How do those in patients with Marfan syndrome look like? And we've taken here uh, capsules from four different patients with Marfan syndrome and stained them the same way as we did this one. And you can see that these strong, long, well-formed zonules are no longer there. They're fragmented. They're uh, small bits and pieces here, maybe uh, longer ones, but they don't come together. They don't assemble properly to form that rigging. So that's what causes the zonule not to be normal. So just to summarize what we've talked so far, fibrillin is a major structural component of the lens capsule. It's distributed in three anatomical location of the capsule, and it plays a role not only in suspending the lens, but in accommodation, which is the focusing of the lens. And this is why some patients with Marfan syndrome cannot focus well. And it also contributes to the structural integrity of the uh, capsule. Uh, it interacts, fibrillin interacts with a number of other molecules. I just showed you a list of them. We're not gonna talk about them, uh, but Together, all these proteins lead to a normal structure and function of the capsule. And if any of them is, is uh, bad, is abnormal, the lens may be dislocated. Um, so what can happen in the eye of patients who have Marfan syndrome? Certainly the most characteristic, uh, one uh, feature that we see rarely in other conditions is uh, the subluxation of the lens. But there are other things that can happen, such as uh, having a flat cornea, not very curved, flat cornea. Uh, the axial length of the eye from front to back length of the eye, which is normally 23, 24 millimeters, can be uh, en enlarged over time. Uh, the iris and the muscles of the iris that are responsible for making the pupil dilate and constrict and dilate and constrict are not well developed. So patients who have Marfan syndrome have a difficult time getting their pupils dilated, and I'm sure some of you have experienced uh, that when you go to see your eye doctor. Uh, less common, but quite important because those are 
uh, situations that need to be treated are strabismus, which is ocular misalignment of the eye, glaucoma, and uh, of course retinal detachment that can cause a significant loss of vision in patients who otherwise have had good vision before it happens. Some questions that have been answered uh, over the years are, uh, for example, does the type of mutation in fibrillin influence the clinical manifestations of Marfan syndrome? And the answer is yes. Depending on where the mutation is, certain organ systems are affected more than others. And as far as the eye is concerned, if the mutations are at the five prime end of the gene, you know, there's a five prime end and a three prime end of the gene and everything in between. So if the mutations are close to the five prime end of the gene, patients are much more likely to have uh, dislocated lenses or uh, ocular involvement. Uh, this, this is a study that we published, uh, I can see here, 2003. We took a number of, of patients who have come to the Cleveland Clinic to see if they had, the question was, do I have Marfan syndrome? Okay, and we wanted to see, uh, depending on uh, why they were here, what the outcome was. So uh, a third of those who had a family history of Marfan syndrome actually turned out to have it. Uh, Another third had skeletal findings that were tall and, and slim and maybe uh, the basketball coach or somebody or their primary care doctor referred them because of the skeletal findings. Um, or they had cardiovascular signs, about 41%. But we see that the highest number uh, or the highest percentage of patients who turn out to have Marfan syndrome when they present are those who have a dislocated lens. All it tells us is that this is a much more uh, predictive finding rather than the others because all the other traits, you can have them even if you don't have Marfan syndrome. So what happens when the lens dislocates, gets out of its normal position? Um, the lens normally functions to focus the eye, the eye, sorry, focus the, the targets all the way back onto the retina so we can see them clearly. And th when it moves out of its position, there's a lot of distortion. And when the shape of the lens also changes, uh, it causes astigmatism and that can also cause distortion of vision that you, we may or may not be able to correct with glasses. So there's blur. Sometimes if the lens is positioned in such a way, patients may even have double vision out of one eye because there's two images. And if the lens is moving too much, which can occur in some patients, uh, there's fluctuation of vision depending on where the position of the lens is. Uh, from a visual perspective as opposed to an optical perspective, uh, there, the lens dislocation can cause uh, ametropia, which is a, the occurrence of myopia or nearsightedness or astigmatism. Uh, and in turn, this high error of refraction can cause amblyopia or a lazy eye. Uh, the lens, when it's out of its normal position, can become opaque. It, a cataract can develop. The lens has to be in its normal position and the capsule has to be intact and normal for the lens to continue to be transparent. If it loses its transparency, that's when we call it a cataract. And uh, finally, maybe a lens that moves can induce micro trauma to the very front part of the retina here, and over time, that can cause a, a drag on the retina and induce a retinal tear, and then induce a retinal detachment. So it, it's really not good to have a lens that is loose inside the eye. Now, in many patients with Marfan <coughs> syndrome, the lens is displaced but it's not loose, it's, it's stable in its, in its position. Uh, I talked about uh, uh, the systemic disorders that can have dislocated lenses, we're not gonna go over that, and there's certainly certain eye conditions that can cause the lens to be displaced from its normal position. So, bottom line, not very specific to Marfan syndrome, however, if we look at the anatomy 
of the subluxation of how the lens looks, we can tell differences between a lens that's dislocated in a patient with Marfan syndrome as opposed to a lens that's dislocated in homocystinuria. It looks different. The zonules, for example, are stretched and long in patients with Marfan syndrome, whereas in homocystinuria they're like dissolved, they're just not there. And depending on how the lens moves, we can also uh, de determine what kind of underlying problem there may be. Uh, a lot of uh, eye doctors do not know how to examine very specifically for the presence of a mild dislocation of the lens. If it's evident, it's evident. Nobody's going to miss it. But if it's a very mild degree of subluxation, it may be missed. And the way uh, we, we do it is we have the patient not only look straight ahead and we look with the slit lamp, the red reflex you see is the light coming back from the inside of the eye at the observer through, through the microscope. But we also ask the patient to look down. So here's the patient is looking down and we're looking from above or behind the edge of the pupil and then we see the edge of the lens. That dark line you see in the bottom there, that's the edge of the lens. Normally, that we shouldn't be able to see that. If we see the edge of the lens, it means the lens is subluxated. So, as I said, if we look at how the lens looks in its abnormal position, we can tell or we can guess what the problem is. This is a patient who has Marfan syndrome. The lens is moved superiorly, so we see its inferior edge, and it's irregular because some zonular fibers are longer than others. This is a patient here who has uh, homocystinuria. The lens has no zonule, they're gone, they're totally gone, and the lens has actually moved to the front of the eye, in front of the pupil, and it's now sitting in the anterior segment. And it, there it can cause a whole bunch of problems that we don't normally see in patients with Marfan syndrome. Uh, it is a condition called ectopia lentis et pupillae, where not only is the lens in an abnormal position. You can see here the edge of the lens and it has moved in this direction. And this part is the part of the pupil that does not have a lens in it. But in addition, the pupil is displaced and there may be remnants of other structures in the front part of the eye that are not there. So th that's what I call the anatomy of the subluxation. It gives us uh, a lot of uh, information. Now when the lens moves out of its normal position. It can also cause other problems, uh, such as uh, very high pressure if it blocks the pupil. We call that ang uh, pupillary block glaucoma. And here's, here are two eyes that, are, that look very angry and inflamed as a consequence of that. And in this particular patient, the vitreous was so fluidy, which is not usually the case, that the lens has dropped all the way back onto the surface of the retina. These are quite, quite rare cases. Both, both of these situations are quite unusual. Um, in, in this slide, what I'm trying to show you is that uh, the edge of the lens is right here. The, the, this part of the pupil has no lens in it, and the lens itself, you see this yellow a dull reflex in it, it's a cataract. So not only is it dislocated, but there's also a cataract in it. And patients may have a subluxated lens for a long, long time and have reasonably good vision through their glasses and then their vision starts to drop because now that lens has become cataractous and that's one of the indications to remove the lens in a patient with Marfan syndrome. Uh, the other problems, uh, strabismus or ocular misalignment and this is from a series uh, back in 1994 when I was still at, uh, at Hopkins that we reviewed uh, 573 patients and we found that 11% of them had exotropia or the eyes that drift out and 2% had esotropia. This number is very close to the normal, uh, to, to the distribution of the general population but this is a quite a high number, not you know, 12%. So there's a predisposition for the eyes to drift out. And I mentioned this before, amblyopia or a lazy eye, about 8%, which is surprisingly low in patients who have all these types of problems. And the reason it is low is because when vision is developing in the baby in the first two, three years of life, the lens may still have been in its normal position or the baby was just very nearsighted 
but when they're nearsighted, they can hold things close, so there is no deprivation of visual stimulation, and then amblyopia does not set in as it would in, in other situations. So that's, uh, in a way, uh, r relatively good news. And knowing that, uh, what we can predict is that if vision is decreased because the lens is out, out of its normal position, when we remove the lens, we are, we are going to obtain good vision because there has not been deprivation amblyopia uh, from childhood. And in, indeed, that's what we find when we, uh, when we do that. How do we treat strabismus and amblyopia? We correct the errors of refraction. If there's a need for glasses, we, we give patients their glasses. If they indeed have amblyopia, we patch uh, the better seeing eye and vision does improve. And if the eyes are misaligned and they need strabismus surgery, we do that just like in any other person. And there are no specific precautions that we need to take. And the results, the outcomes are, are fairly good. Glaucoma. Um, there are several types of oops sorry there are several types of glaucoma. Uh, the most common we call it open angle glaucoma. The angle is that uh, recess between the cornea and the iris that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, but there are other types of glaucoma, and if we look at the open angle glaucoma, and this is also from uh, our series at Hopkins, you can see that as patients get older. Okay, the prevalence of glaucoma gets higher and higher, and by the time uh, patients are in their 60s, uh, uh, almost a third or more would have glaucoma, as opposed to maybe 3 or 4 percent in the general population. So there's definitely a predisposition to open-angle glaucoma in adults with uh, Marfan syndrome. In the children, it's much, much, much less uh, common. How do we treat glaucoma? Eye drops, for the most part, can control it uncommonly and unlikely uh, for that to happen, but surgery may be necessary. Um, in the cornea, the corneas are flat, uh, characteristically, and I don't expect you to in interpret this, but usually uh, blue means flat, and there are a couple numbers here, 39 and 40, that's a pretty flat cornea. The normal one would be 43, 44, and the colors on this chart would be like red and green. So cor cataracts, uh, sorry, corneas are flat and thin. The flatness turns out to be quite um, suggestive of uh, Marfan syndrome. I'm trying to skip forward, but this is a study we conducted here a few years ago. Uh, enrolled over 160 patients, 170 patients. Some had definite Marfan syndrome and some were judged definitely not to have Marfan syndrome. And we compared uh, those two groups of patients and uh, to see which ones had flat corneas and which ones did not. And it's v it was very clear that the the blue ones here are the normal, that you see the distribution, and the ones with in red are the Marfan, and they are on the flatter end of the spectrum. So patients with Marfan syndrome have flat corneas. Why do we need to know that? It's important in diagnosis when the other signs are absent, so we do that uh, measurement every time. And second, it could be a, a, a factor in fitting patients with contact lenses and the difficulties that some patients may have in wearing contact lenses because their corneas are, are pretty flat. Um, this is just some more data from, from that uh, a paper. And from that paper, we uh, concluded that uh, uh, fibrillin defects in, in Marfan syndrome lead to significant corneal abnormalities, but that some clinical tests such as keratometry, topography, allow us to quantitate those, and that any time we see a patient with, whose corneas are 41 diopters or less, that's a measure of, of the flatness of the cornea, uh, we, we will use that to, to tell us whether they are likely or unlikely to have Marfan syndrome evidently in the absence of molecular testing because that's kind of the most uh, definitive way to, to diagnose it. Um, I th this is the last uh, part of, of my presentation. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, lens extraction in, in children with Marfan syndrome. 
uh, and I'm not going to address it in adults because that's the question that always comes up. The lens is located, should we remove it, should we leave it? Uh, what happens if we don't and what happens if we do? So th there are many uh, considerations, of course, the age uh, of the patient, other health issues, you know, priorities, what should we take care of first? Uh, what is the be level of best corrected visual acuity? And th this is critical because I've, I've found and others have found over the years that patients may not have had the best possible refraction by their f eye doctors. It, it, these are difficult refractions to do, and unless you take your time and you know what you're doing well, you might decide, oh, this is the best I can have this patient see because the lens is subluxated, when in fact, if you take your time, you may be able to find a better refraction, better visual acuity, or refract them through that part of their pupil that does not have a lens behind it, and then achieve very good vision that allows then the deferral of any uh, surgery, at least, at least for a while. Patients who have vision that fluctuates, the lens is loose, you know, that's a clear-cut indication to, to remove uh, the lens. And certainly, if the lens itself is opaque, like, like I showed you in that picture, the lens has a cataract in addition to being uh, displaced, that lens needs uh, to come out. Can, can, can you tell me if I'm running on time or behind? Five minutes, okay. So uh, I'm going to go a little faster here. Here is, there's a very mild subluxation. This is the edge of the pupil. That's the pupil with the red reflex coming from the back. Vision is usually good. Astigmatism is little. We're not going to touch this patient. Okay. Uh, here's a patient here where uh, the lens is uh, kind of bisecting the pupil. The lens is here that's aphakic, and you can actually see some of the zonule. If we refract the patient through this part, they will see quite well. Here, there's going to be a, a ton of myopia, a ton of astigmatism. So, but they can still be refracted through that part. And if the vision is acceptable, we would also not remove the lens. Uh, in this case, the lens is totally round and small. We call that microspherophakia, and is loose. So we, we need to take that lens out. Um, how do we remove it? The type of surgery? What it boils down to at the end is, should we implant an intraocular lens or should we leave that eye without a lens in it? And I'm sure those of you who have had the surgery or have consulted with people, uh, especially in the last maybe 10 years or so, have had different opinions I maintain and that's how I treat my patients, that we should not have an implant placed inside the eye. We leave our patients aphakic. They can wear a contact lens. They can wear glasses. Uh, the reason for it is that the rate of complications of implanted lenses in uh, patients who have dislocated lenses of, of this kind is unacceptably high. And to me, unacceptably high is any, anything more than 3 5% is unacceptably high. You know, if, I can, if we can avoid it, we should avoid it. And this is why I've, I continue to, to uh, recommend not having an implant. Now, there are newer implants that are being tested. They're called iris claw lenses to, that, that are uh, clipped onto the front part of the iris. They also cause problems. They also dislocate. Um, and there's a, a study on them now that has about a third of the patients have had some, some degree uh, of a problem uh, and had to be re the lens had to be repositioned. Contact lenses are pretty safe. Glasses are fine. The surgery is faster. Uh, almost any one of us can do it. Implanting a lens when there is no capsular support is much more complicated. There are a few super surgeons who know how to do that, but those are also super abnormal, structurally abnormal eyes, and, and the, the rules are different. Uh, this is a series of patients that we published uh, in about five, I can't remember, 10 years ago, maybe, and we had a total of 42 eyes of 22 patients who have had uh, their lenses removed and 
did not get an implant, and vision was 20, 30 or better in all of them. There was one patient who had the retinal detachment, and that was after an injury, after the lens had been removed. But uh, follow-up uh, of many, many years now, they remain in, in pretty good shape. And what we've also discovered is that most patients' eyes are not long. In fact, they are of normal lengths. Some, some patients with Marfan syndrome would have very long eyeballs, and maybe those patients have a higher risk of retinal detachment. But the majority have normal length eyes, and the myopia, the nearsightedness is due to the change in shape of the lens rather than an increase in the length of the eye. Um, I think I can stop here and take some questions, a couple of questions. So let, let me repeat the question for those who didn't hear it. Uh, is the effect of Marfan on vision uh, only related to the, the blurriness or the inability to see well, or is it, or can it be also related to reading difficulties where things kind of, uh, what, what you said, like dyslexia almost? Yeah. And the, the answer is that it's only on the blur of, of the vision. Dyslexia is a, is a disorder of the brain, so it's in the interpretation of what you see. Now, if the lens is moved out of its normal position and it's making uh, the lines that you look at in a text uh, distorted, then that's also vision, that's also distortion. It has nothing to do with how you interpret them. Was that the pushing That is not Marfan. Uh, it, it, it needs to be, uh, that person needs to be examined uh, to determine what it is. But dyslexia and uh, ability to interpret findings and reading material is, is a brain function, and that part is totally normal in patients with Marfan syndrome. Yes? Very, very good question. Uh, the question is about LASIK surgery, and I'm sure this comes up all the time. Now, uh, several reasons not to have LASIK surgery. So the very simple uh, answer that is broad is we do not recommend LASIK surgery for patients with Marfan syndrome. The reasons are, number one, uh, the cornea is thinner although it's not very specific for Marfan syndrome, but it is definitely thinner by about 10, 15%, and that's usually what they need to shave off the cornea in LASIK surgery. And number two, uh, the nearsightedness in Marfan syndrome is related to the lens, to the shape of the lens, and that continues to change over time, even in adults, and, and many of you have experienced that uh, you don't stop getting more and more nearsighted when you finish your teenage years. In fact, that can continue on. So you get LASIK surgery for six diopters or 10 diopters of myopia, only to find that a year or two later, you're almost back to where you started. And the structure of the cornea is also probably not normal. We've done studies on that too. It's much more uh, flexible and malleable, just like other parts of your body. And if we reduce even further, the thickness of the cornea, we make that cornea even more predisposed to either rupturing or, or, or being more uh, prone to, to damage from even minor injuries. So uh, I, I wouldn't get it done. <laughs>